Welcome to Meditation and Aliens with Doro and Matt, a webcast that explores everything we currently know about the truth about aliens, human history, reality, consciousness, and the role meditation can do to help us understand all these things, and how we might all work together to build the best world possible for all beings, human or non-human alike. Meditation and Aliens is hosted by me, Matt Reddy. I'm an amateur ufologist. I have a degree in philosophy. I'm the creator of HiveOne.net. I'm the author of a book called Revolutionary Mindfulness. That's about meditation and activism. I'm also an elected public hospital commissioner in Jefferson County, Washington. Each week, I am joined by Doro Kiley, longtime meditator, a meditation teacher, and an experiencer with many stories and life coach extraordinaire. You can find more about Doro at her website, creationcoach.com. Now, on to the show. All right, we are back again for another episode of Meditation and Aliens. How are you doing, Doro? Oh my goodness, I can't wait. I'm always waiting to see what you can bring to the table, and it's I never, I never am disappointed, so looking <laughs> forward to it. Yeah, well, I've got a couple uh, things prepared today to to go over and to uh, some video clips I've mashed together. Awesome. Yeah, and um, and let's see. Last night there was in Port Townsend, Washington, there was a presentation uh, at the local library. It was about the Maury Island incident, uh, which I had never heard of before. It was in nineteen. 19- uh, 47, right before, yeah, June 21st, 1947. So this was before Roswell and before Kenneth Arnold. Um, Kenneth Arnold is purported to be the first person to see a flying saucer in the modern flying saucer era, sort of kicked off what they call the Summer of Saucers in 1947. What was his name? Kenneth what? Kenneth Arnold. And he claimed he saw uh, nine shiny UFOs flying past Mount Rainier at incredible speeds. It got nationwide news. Soon after that, the the Roswell crash happened, and then they invented the Air Force, and the Air Force took over all investigations of UFOs, and basically that was the beginning of the Air Force covering up and you know doing Project Blue Book and all the basically hiding everything about UFOs since that time. That totally makes sense. I mean, that's that's right after the war. That's when everything started happening. So I guess this is all the puzzles to the the peace puzzles coming together here. Um, yeah. So yeah, you're you're but, filling it in for us. Well, so yeah. Well, this Maury. I, first of all, it was amazing that Port Townsend, this little town, had this event because it had like 50 people. The the room was packed. The presenter went over, you know, updated everyone on what's been happening in Congress. And so I was just like, oh, finally, they are talking about this, you know, to a big crowd in my town about what is going on with UFOs and aliens. It's like, and it was good to see so many people there. Yeah. Um, But this incident, just to summarize it, is crazy. Uh, And the reason it's lost in history and no one talks about it is because eventually the the guy who was the primary witness, uh, he basically... Uh, at the end decided it, he'd prefer to be um, seen as a liar. So he was just like, I'm just going to tell people it's a hoax because he got so ridiculed and it just like was so impacting his life oh. that he, you know, and so once he was like, fine, it's a hoax, it sort of deleted it from history and no one really ever talked about it again. But it's, if you, it actually got all the way to, um, uh, to Hoover and the FBI, and there's clearly documented reports from the FBI that he was saying it was a hoax just to get out of under the pressure of it. He he bullied this this incident. Really, seems all the evidence is this evi- this incident happened. But this is the incident. Let me just summarize it. Yeah, yeah. He went out on a fishing boat with two crewmen and his son and the family dog. They were out on the water on the Puget Sound, like. Four to six, I think it was six, uh, donut-shaped, shiny flying saucers came out of the sky. One seemed to be having some sort of trouble, and it started exploding and spewing out molten slag, molten metal. This stuff, this molten metal hit the boat, and it hit, uh, burned one his son on the arm, I believe, and it killed the dog. 
Oh my gosh. And they, wow. had, they, they, they ran the boat ashore to get away from this thing. They were totally freaked out. They told everyone um, about it in the sea. And then the FBI and the Air Force, which had just been created, uh, actually, no, the FBI came to investigate. And long and this crazy stuff happened after this. Oh, the next day, one man in black showed up at this guy's place and interviewed him and knew everything about the incident. So this was actually the first reference in history of the man in men in black being involved oh. in investigating these UFOs and warning him to never talk about it again. Um, and that's kind of one of the controversial things about this story is because there's other towns and other UFO lore people that want to claim the men in black were first brought up in another place, but this is truly historically the first reference even if he somehow made it up which he didn't this is the that, first time the men crazy. in black were brought up. yeah now my the first the first uh, intuitive hit i get on this is that that whatever it was my guess is that it was one of the first experimental uh crafts that we attempted to make is that do you think that could be possible because it I was mean, it, we were back engineering each, uh, that technology already right my understanding is the back engineering didn't really start until after Roswell. Like Roswell was, um, that's when they started. That's when they created the Air Force. It seems like the Air Force was created as one way to start um, hiding these craft. These oh, craft. Okay. And there were six of them and most of them were working fine. So it is a weird event that one was like spewing out this molten slag that they were doing it right over top of a fishing boat, which seems really an odd Winston. So did was there any attempt to like recover any of that metal or Well so they they when the Air Force sent two investigators the they gave they had a bunch of slag on the boat so they gave a bunch of the samples to the Air Force the Air Force put them in a crate tops and marked it top secret took it on a like a a B52 plane and they were flying it to a base and the plane crashed Oh. <laughs> and the and they did recover the uh material from the crash site but it somehow was lost uh after that <laughs> and two pilots on the plane died um and there were apparently two passengers on the plane that parachuted out and survived but but the two crewmen that were on the boat were ne have never been found uh the two other witnesses they've been they're lost in history the Whoa. sun never talked about this event because there was it was a lot of like humiliation and ridicule and pressure from it. And, and apparently bad things, you know, the men in black said bad things are going to happen if you talk about this. And his son went missing for like several days at one point after this, his wife got sick. So it, it seems it's a weird, there's a lot of weird stuff about the event besides the fact that the dog was killed and that was traumatic. Oh, it sounds very sci-fi. They could make yeah. a movie out of that. Wow. Yeah. But, um, but I was just so one, I was so pleased to learn about this. And it's fascinating that this was really before Kenneth Arnold, before Roswell. And it's so local to me. It's like uh really interesting. Yeah. And that I was just so happy that our town like had people there and they're learning about this. And it was just like, oh, finally, you guys need to pay attention. There's something going on here and we need to learn about this and and open our minds and figure so it's so it sounds like Port Townsend is really kind of open minded about all of this. Is that yeah, that's what it looks like. Well, so, we got a, this is a very eclectic town. Uh, I think of it as sort of like the Berkeley of the Northwest. Oh, cool. But we don't have a college and it's getting very old. So it's sort of like a lot of old uh, retired hippies and uh, sort of a new generation of young. I mean, I think of them as hippies, very liberal, artsy. Um, yeah. A lot, and a lot of good dancers, a lot of good conscious dance, meditation, gurus, yeah. witches, uh you know, in the background, there's plenty of like baby boomers and, you know, uh, mainstream people here too now, but um, mm. there's, it's got this alternative culture. Well, I like, I like that it was open-minded enough to have a meeting like that. So. Yeah. Okay. So that's one thing. But yeah. Now I got some uh, news updates. You ready? Oh yeah. Okay. Let me see where I got the, I uh, got this uh, queued up on my screen screen a couple things and i'll go ahead and screen share but we'll just describe it for our audio audience but the those who watch the uh youtube video will uh will be able to see everything that we share here okay so first of all sean kirkpatrick um 
I got a, all right, I got an image on the screen here, which is my picture of some of the major players. And over here on the right is Sean Kirkpatrick. He was the head of Arrow. Um, are you seeing this okay? Yeah. Okay. So the the Congress insisted that the Pentagon create a uh, department to investigate UFOs and figure out what's going on. They put this guy, Sean Kirkpatrick, in charge of it. He seems to be one of the secret keepers. He's been always, um, he's just been dismissive and skeptical. His boss was uh, this Susan Go. She's this, our spokesperson for the Pentagon. In any case, he, he got kicked out of Arrow uh, because no one trusted him. None of the whistleblowers wanted to go talk to him because he just wasn't, uh, um, no one trusted him. Mm -hmm. As the Pentagon was investigating. So he publishes in Scientific American this article on Jan uh, a few days ago, January 19th. And this is, he says, what I learned, the U.S. government's UFO hunter. And he writes that they, blah, blah, blah. Um, he says, you know, after painstakingly assembling a team of highly talented and motivated personnel, Working on this, blah, blah, blah. Our efforts were ultimately overwhelmed by sensational but unsupported claims that ignored contradictory evidence, yet captured the attention of policymakers and the public, driving legislative battles and dominating the public narrative. Oops. And the result of this whirlwind of tall tales, fabrication, and secondhand or thirdhand retellings of the same was a social media frenzy and a significant amount of congressional and executive time and energy spent on investigating these so-called claims as if we didn't have anything better to do. The conspiracy theory goes something like this, that the U.S. has been hiding and attempting to reverse and engineer as many as 12 UAP UFOs from as early as the 1960s. And let me just pause there. Fascinating that he intentionally <laughs> slurs the story inaccurately right there. Right. The story is now that it's much many crafts than that. And back all the way to the 30s, at a minimum, is David Grush. So he intentionally misrepresents it. And then he goes, this great cover-up and conspiracy failed to produce any salient results. And consequently, he says the effort was abandoned to some private sector defense contractors to continue the work. Now, again, I have to pause. He is intentionally slur you know, yeah. shifting it again. That is not the story that it failed and went to the private sector, it was that they hid it using the private sector intentionally. And there's, um, anyways. And then um, let's go down to another part of his. Um, he, he says that that during a full scale, year long investigation of this story, which has been told and retold by a small group of interconnected believers and others with possibly less than honest intentions none of whom have firsthand accounts of any of this arrow discovered a few things, but none were about aliens. And he says no record exists of any president or living department of defense or intelligent community leader knowing about this alleged program, nor any congressional committee having such knowledge. Okay. Wow. That's fa it's fascinating. He uses the word living DOD. Yeah. Or yeah. I saw that. <laughs> so it's almost like he's admitting there's a few dead people. <laughs> right. <laughs> that may have known some stuff. Okay. So this hit the airwaves and Twitter uh, went crazy about Kirkpatrick, uh, this article. And then let me show you a few things that happened. Um, so Lou Elizondo, let's start with Christopher Mellon. So Christopher Mellon did my picture here. Um, scroll over to that. These are the, uh, these are the players that are, I think, a, a secret government military disclosure team. And we got Lou Elizondo, Christopher Mellon, uh, David Fravor, Alex Dietrich, Ryan Graves, this guy, Sean Cahill, uh, David Grush, uh, Rear Admiral Gallaudet, Gallaudet, and this guy, Hal Putoff. These are like major, major central players. And they are all former government or military hmm. or intelligence. And so, but they're vocal. And Lou Elizondo was the first to come out, but him and, and then Christopher Mellon came out um, and later David Grush. So I got a, a bunch of stuff from them. So Christopher Mellon, former Sec Deputy Secretary of Defense, he, he responds to Kirkpatrick on Twitter. I was astonished by one of the central claims by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick in his recent article in Scientific American, blasting UAP conspiracists, 
specifically his claim that as of the time of my departure, none, let me repeat, none of the conspiracy-minded whistleblowers in the public eye had elected to come to Arrow to provide their evidence. Oh. And Christopher Mellon writes, I'm baffled because in an effort to assist his investigation, I introduced Dr. Kirkpatrick to the former director of ATIP program, Lou Elizondo, as well as Dr. Eric Davis and Dr. Hal Putoff. Each of these prominent voices associated with the ATIP program spent hours briefing Dr. Kirkpatrick in a classified setting. And uh, so he said that. Wow. And Lou, Eliz Lou Elizondo, yeah, goes on here <laughs> and says, Many, let me repeat, many people who I know personally have spoken to Arrow and provided detailed information to Kirkpatrick and his office for the record. If Arrow isn't willing to tell the truth to Congress, we are. Well, so, he's obviously a secret keeper. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, okay. And so then, and then this breaks just a couple days ago. Uh, this is January 25th. So four days later, five or six days later, I can't do math. Um. And this seems to be like why Kirkpatrick's article came out when it did, because he knew this was going to come out. The Pentagon uh, Inspector General released a report that says um, that the Pentagon's response to the UFOs is uncoordinated and excludes major Department of Defense commands. This is according to an unclassified summary of an Inspector General report released Thursday. Roughly a year after Congress tasked the Pentagon with developing a comprehensive plan across its vast breadth of components for documenting and seeking to understand UAPs, um, the major Department of Defense elements still don't have guidance. Um, there's gaps in collection and now they, they say gaps in collection and analysis could leave threats to flight safety unaddressed. They say the Department of Defense has no overarching UAP policy, and as a result, it lacks assurance that national security and flight safety threats to the United States from UAP have been identified and mitigated. They say the Department of Defense may not have developed a comprehensive and coordinated strategy for understanding, identifying, and protecting against unidentified phenomena that may present a safety threat to military personnel and territory. Um, and so this is I mean, this is the inspector general really saying the Department of Defense is not doing what Congress has asked it to do, is not protecting us and protecting right. pilots from what the heck the, these things could pose a risk. Yeah. Ah, so. So. So, so if I if I'm clear, then this this Kirkpatrick, he's he's overseeing that he's been somehow put in the position to oversee this. He was in charge of Arrow. He's been. Oh reassigned so arrow oh. currently doesn't have anyone in charge of it um there's okay. so and so now him going and writing this article in scientific american it's still basically you know his article sounds like it's still coming from the head of arrow because there is no other head of arrow that's you know yeah but yes he's he's technically not in um he's been fired because okay. uh, people don't trust him not doing his job yes <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's some of the fascinating drama, and and now I've got actually more. This is now I'm at to the, the fun part. You ready for a little bit? Oh more? yes, yes, let's okay. do it. So this group of uh, I'm fascinated with the group of Lou Elizondo, Christopher Mellon, and Grush, and all these guys because I can, it just seems to me yes they are in favor of disclosure, but they are so clearly coordinated and only want to disclose. The bare minimum. They only want to disclose that UFOs are real and we should be admitting that some form of non-human intelligence is real and we should be dealing with this. They don't want to say anything more than that. And they actively fight against, you know, people like Greer and Bob Lazar who are willing to go much further and say what's really going on. And I put together a little video here that really illustrates this. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. And so, um, all right. So we'll just, just going to see it on my uh, screen here, the way I play it. Okay. So first of all, this is all going to be really about Bob Lazar's claims as a focus, because I got clips of them talking about it. Bob Lazar, you know, and I'm just showing on the screen. This is a, this is from the first, I mean, I'll just play the beginning of this. Um, this is from the first report of Bob Lazar back in the 80s when George Knapp um, uh, revealed what he said. But but in summary, Bob Lazar said he worked at S4, which is near Area 51, 
He worked on alien spacecraft and he worked with something called Element 115, which was the power source of these spacecraft, which has amazing properties for anti-gravity. And I'll just play a little bit of the beginning of uh, this old news article, old uh, video. Okay. News station article. Los Alamos officials told us they had no records of a Robert Lazar ever working there. They were either mistaken or were lying. A 1982 phone book from the lab lists Lazar right there among the other scientists and technicians. EG&G, which is where Lazar says he was interviewed for the job at S4, also has no records. It's as if someone has made him disappear. Well, they're trying to make me a non-person. According to Lazar, his employer was the United States Navy. He says he and other government employees would gather near EG&G, fly to Groom Lake, and then a very few people would get into a bus with blacked out or no windows and drive to S4. When you get off the bus, what do you see? Okay, so then he describes, he describes the hangar doors. Um, let me see if I want to play any, any back. There's there's plenty of stuff on Bob Lazar, you know. That's talk, interesting. I mean, they're out. really just trying to make him disappear. It almost makes me wonder, you know, <laughs> if the Mandela effect is is influencing this. But yeah, interesting. Yeah. So. So okay. So I'll play. So he, Bob Lazar is the reason we know about Area 51. Him and George Knapp, and. And so these secret keepers, sorry, not these, uh, I call this Team USA, the disclosure team, they don't ever want to draw attention to Bob Lazar because I believe it draws attention to Area 51 and to Element 115. And here's some video clips to sort of like show what they have uh, said when asked about him. Hmm. I am telling the truth. I, I, I... Oops, not there, right here. True. If I'd been to Area 51. I didn't see any flying saucers or anything like that. What did you say? <laughs> Who was that talking well, there? This is Christopher Mellon, Deputy Secretary of Defense on the Joe Rogan show, asked okay. about Bob Lazar. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Area 51. I didn't see any flying saucers or anything like that. What did you see? <laughs> I saw uh, Defense Department. Uh, uh, experiments being performed and, and training activities and that sort of thing. Nothing that the taxpayer would uh, uh, object to. But, of course um, not. But it's a big range. There's a lot of stuff going on out there, and there's right. a lot of adjacent ranges. Uh, if you look at Area the map, actually. Four, where he was. That's what he said, yeah. yeah. That's what um, he said. Can you get okay, so that's what he said about, uh, you know, huh. dismissing the whole Area 51, S4. And uh, this is what Burchett now, I also think Burchett was going along here with trying to downplay anything about Area 51. Listen to what he says. Give me the names and titles of the people with direct firsthand knowledge uh, and access to some of this crash retrieval, some of these crash retrieval programs, and maybe which facilities, military bases that would the recovered material would be in. And I know a lot of Congress have talked about we're going to go to Area 51 and, you know, I mean, there's nothing there anymore anyway. It's just, you know, and we move like a glacier. As soon as we announce it, I'm sure the moving vans would pull up, but please. Uh, I can't discuss that publicly, but I did provide that information both to the Intel committees and the inspector general. And as directed. So I just find it fascinating, Tim Burchett, congressman, asking at the hearing, can you tell me the name of the bases, where this stuff is? And then he's yeah. like, but I want to make it clear, I know nothing's at Area 51. So it's like, <laughs> Because I think he, he, they don't want the public to know that something big, bigger than anything we really can imagine is going on at Area 51 and S4. And I've got, you know, if you dig into the lore, there's some, um, uh, Bill Cooper said, I mean, he said S4 was an underground joint human alien base. And uh, anyways, so that's, that's. But that's two public uh, comments about Area 51. Now, this is about Element 115. Listen to what Lou Elizondo's response when asked about Element 115. Okay. And is directed to both of you, and we'll start with Lou. Lou, while you were in the government, and then this is Sean, while you were in the government, have you ever come across the words Element 115? Did you see it? Did you read it? Did you overhear someone allude to it? So, first of all, Kurt, um, how are you doing? You doing good? Good. You're doing great, good. Now that we've got that out of the way, Kurt, let's answer your question about Element 115. Um, no, um, there is obviously a lot of discussion about it in the uh, Twitterverse and social media, but that was never uh, a part of the, the 
the ATIP portfolio. Uh, doesn't mean it wasn't part of portfolios beforehand or, or perhaps you know some other efforts uh, that were parallel or tangential to ATIP. But while I was in ATIP, Element 115 wasn't ever really part of any type of discussion. Now, uh, the other guy here is Sean Cahill, who is a, a military witness on, I believe he was on one of the boats uh, with the, the Tic Tac incident. But Lou, it's really interesting what Lou says here, because he really <laughs> claims to say he's never going to lie to us. And so his wording here, when he says, Element 115 never really was part of our discussion, is, I think, you interesting. You wonder, yeah. yeah I'm hmm. just going to play that again. Okay. But while I was native, Element 115 wasn't ever really part of any type of discussion. Yeah, I, It wasn't really. That's a that's a vague denial. But anyways, and this is what Sean K. Well, does. you know, that's interesting the way he worded that. I mean, it's not part wasn't part of the discussion, you know, but it yeah. could have been part of everything else. I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah. And I'll just, <laughs> it could have been on paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I never no, I never encountered anything like that. I wouldn't have um, even if it were purportedly anything like what it's supposed to be. I've only heard about it in the uh, the zeitgeist of ufology from the same sources Which, and so yeah it's also interesting the only source i've ever heard discuss element 115 is bob lazar and so when he's like the zeitgeist of ufology and sources they don't mention lazar because i don't think they want to call attention to him um but here is back to the rogan interview what um christopher mellon uh he talked about element 115 but listen how he doesn't call it by the correct name he calls it by uh, a weird name that I've, uh, that I don't know. But anyways, here, listen to this part. I, I found his explanations curious. Um, yeah, how so? The the complexity of it uh, and the fact that he talked about Laurentium, for example, and then decades later, it turns out that um, apparently there is a more stable form of that. Than, That's element 115? I, sounds right. I couldn't yeah. tell you. If, Look at, isn't that hilarious? He's like, sounds right. I don't what yeah i, I mean what, what what did he say lorenzium or yeah, what he calls it? it laurentium which element oh. 115 it just you know it means it's 115 on the periodic table when bob lazar first brought it up this element wasn't on the periodic table but what he's referencing is that years later they did in a lab invent create it but i believe they called it moscovium uh hmm. but he's calling it laurentium which i i'd have to check to see if anyone's ever called it that but I, I believe it might be partly because um, I believe all these military uh, guys, they're all obeying strict orders of what is allowed to be talked about and not. So if they're all under strict orders, do not talk about element 115 or Muscovium, then he can't legally say the correct name for it out loud. Wow. Even if he's trying to do misinformation. So I yeah. anyway, so what? look at his reaction when he's like, you mean element 115? He's like, uh, anyways, uh, uh, I, I found his explanations curious. Um, yeah, how so? The the complexity of it uh, and the fact that he talked about Laurentium, for example, and then decades later, it turns out that um, apparently there is a more stable form of that than that's element one fifteen. I sounds right. I couldn't yeah. tell you. If but sure. it's called Laurentium. Sounds right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's um. And then the, I, I have more clips that I won't play from the Christopher, but Christopher Mellon then goes on to really say some really junk uh, to try to dismiss Bob Lazar. He claims that he has a friend that says Bob Lazar just checked badges at these places. And then another point, he says he thinks Bob Lazar learned at a local bar where how, that's how he found out where they were flying these test craft. Anyway, mm -hmm. some weird. OK, but this is the final one. This is David Grush. I didn't realize I had missed that David Grush had talked about Bob Lazar in an interview. And this yeah. is how he uh, responded. Yeah. Bob Lazar said he worked at a secret facility near Groom Lake where alien technology was being reverse engineered. Do you think Bob Lazar is full of shit? So yeah. I, don't, I don't know if you have yeah, a take. I mean, I'm certainly uh, different than him. I came at it from a different angle. I have no information on Bob Lazar. It wasn't in the scope of my looking into it kind of activities. If he actually ever experienced what he experienced, I literally have no idea. Okay. Okay. So that, I mean, again, that the response is not like 
Bob Lazar is absolutely, he's just, and he's, I think he's really trying not to lie. And so all he says is, I have no information on Bob Lazar. It wasn't in my scope. And he went before Congress and testified that Congress was reverse engineering UFOs. How can Bob Lazar, who claimed to have worked on these UFOs and went public, could not, how could he not be in his scope? Yeah. And how could he not know every detail and have at least tried to interview and talk to Bob Lazar? So to me, I think this just, um, well, and I, I have one final clip. Uh, this is from, because those are all skeptics and those are all part of the secret keepers. If you go outside of the, or not well, not the secret keeper, they're Team USA controlled disclosure. They want controlled disclosure. They don't want to legitimize Bob Lazar because one, I don't want, they don't want to, tell the world where the aliens are actually living. They, that is like, that is, that is a very controversial, I think, um, piece of information where the aliens actually live and that they are, mm -hmm. if there's a base under S4 and that's where the crafts are. They just don't, they don't want to tell the public that. And you mm -hmm. can't talk about Bob Lazar without talking about S4 and really drawing attention to all. And then S4 that ties to all sorts of stories and also element 115. I think, it's probably the most valuable, most dangerous element in existence. And they're, they do not want the entire world to know that. So they just can't give any legitimacy to Lazar. Um, so is Lazar, I mean, he, he was a military background. What was his actual, was he just, oh, a he's a, he's like a physicist engineer, uh, okay. kind of, a eccentric scientist who, and it seems like that's what they, that's who they get to work in these secret programs because yeah. And they actually prefer people that it's easier to discredit. So it's nice if they have a little bit of a shady um, background. And uh, but I've listened, you know, my test is just listening to people. You know, I just mm -hmm. I just have my own like who seems to be telling the truth. And I find Bob Lazar completely credible. And I find those clips I just played of their response about Bob Lazar. Not I smell misinformation in the mm -hmm. way they're talking. Um <laughs> But here, I'll play one more uh, clip. This is now this is Diane Pasolka. She is an independent researcher, and I I believe she is uh, trying to be honest in her assessment of what's going on, though she might be a little bit participating in the hiding. But this is what she said on Lex Friedman podcast. Okay. So regarding Bob Lazar, with respect to his claims, um, again, I have no way to adjudicate whether or not he actually, you know, encountered this. I do have friends who are. And the people that I know who know his story, some know him, um, believe him. And they have said to me that the most important thing that they think he has said, in fact, one of them, I think he made it <laughs> made a meme out of it or something like that it was basically he said uh, maybe the public you know I regret making it public maybe the public isn't ready for this kind of information and basically they've they emphasized that to me and they emphasized it so much that they wanted me to know right so that is somewhat creepy to me so I think okay this poor guy, Bob Lazar, <laughs> so many people, you know, this is what happens to people who have experiences like this. They're questioned, their reputations are put on the line. In some instances, their, their reputations are manipulated on purpose to make them look uncredible. Yeah, so that's kind of goes back to the, uh, the Maury Island incident I was talking about where, right. you know, you just get brutalized by the, um, you know, the ridicule and the efforts to make your life miserable if you if you reveal things. So his comment, you know, maybe the the public isn't ready for this. I mean, what's your thought on that? What do you think about that? Um, do you think we're yeah, ready for this? I think so. I feel like like last night. It was so powerful for me to be in that room at the library and to see this audience of, you know, baby boomers and older people. And they're just they're just their eyes are open and they're like, what is going on? You know, and. um, I mean, I mean, I don't I, I think. 
there might be some shock effects. There might be some, um, you know, I think they're worried about things as simple as like the stock market crashing and maybe, maybe not in the U S but maybe in some countries, uh, that literally government's getting destabilized if this really got public. And I guess, you know, and I guess there's also, there's the house of cards of really the truth of going all the way, what the, really the truth is behind this. I think that's why they're so afraid to admit anything beyond UFOs and the basic idea of NHIs because it, the, the thread that gets unraveled that seems to get unraveled goes back to Eisenhower actually signing a treaty with aliens and then and that treaty involving the right to abduct humans and and the whole military industrial complex of the US secretly being uh running things behind the scenes with a a uh a secret you know world government that we haven't really even known about um I'm preparing I, I I've been uh and I'm, this is not my own stuff. I, I've been preparing this from uh, stuff I got. Bill Cooper wrote a book called On a Pale Horse. He talks about Majestic 12, talks about the Bilderberg Group and the uh, NSA and the CIA and the Air Force basically being secretly running the world. What about the, the Rothschilds? Are they? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. It, it was um, Eisenhower, or not the Rothschilds, it was the Rockefellers, I think. Okay. Uh, but it was. Uh, I don't, it, I think he didn't specifically mentioned that Rockefeller, um, helped, uh, Eisenhower. Oh, I do have another, can you handle one more clip? Oh, I can. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. How, I mean, yeah, we just, do you want to leave time for a little meditation at the end? We can. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. This will be a short one. So sure. this is, um, Richard Dolan interviewing a guy on his deathbed who says he was in the military. He got sent to work in Washington to advise Eisenhower. And this was, and they mentioned right here, Majestic 12, he was there to help Eisenhower get information from Majestic 12 about the alien program that was going on at Area 51. And listen to this. This is, yeah. so this is, he's military, but he's not part of the controlled disclosure team, obviously, by what he says. So here we go. Okay. Went into the old office and Eisen, President Eisenhower was there in Nixon. And they said, uh, we called the people in from MJ-12 from Area 51 and S-4, but uh, they told us that the government had no jurisdiction over what they were doing. So being a general, past general, you didn't tell him to go to hell without any real good reason, you know? Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, I want you and your boss to fly out there. I want you to give him a personal message. And he says, I want you to tell them, whoever is in charge, tell them that to get in, they have this week, coming week, to get into Washington and to report to me. And if they don't, I'm gonna get the first army from Colorado. I'm gonna go over, I'm gonna take the base over. I don't care what kind of classified material you got. We're gonna rip this thing apart. Eisenhower was going to invade yes, Area, Area 51. 51. Yeah, with the first army. So you go out with your superior? Yes. So that, that was just the part I wanted to play. Yeah. Crazy. Wow. He's saying he was in the Oval Office with Eisenhower and Nixon, and Eisenhower was frustrated that MJ-12, this group that he thought he created to be the group to, to really oversee everything alien-related, and he was realizing MJ-12 wasn't giving him any of the information <laughs> access. And this is what Bill Cooper also said. Presidents are not allowed at Area 51 and S-4. It is outside of and so eisenhower here was saying if you guys do not start reporting to me i am going to invade area 51 with the army wow i mean i think that's i think that i mean that's basically saying area 51 and s4 that's why i think this might be true they might really be not even considered u.s territory it's not under control of the president it may be under control of the secret Majestic 12, Bilderberg Group, World Government, and aliens, or some combination of those, that even the president is not allowed there. I mean, yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the whole thing about, you know, I mean, one disclosure is going to lead to the next. You know, one disclosure is going to open up a whole can of worms. And, and so everybody's going to want to ask more questions. And 
this could go on for a long time. And how far down the rabbit hole can we go? I mean, is this going to turn into, you know, something like we're all just experiments in a Petri dish? And, you know, <laughs> what is it that we can't handle? That's what I'm wondering about. Yeah. I mean, even if it's just as simple as that, that our government is a farce, that the United Nations is a farce, that the real government of Earth is the Bilderberg Group. And I've heard that it was the Rothschilds. Now, yeah, that that's we got to look more into that because that brings up isn't the Bilderbergs mostly like the bankers and the elite? I'm just I'm just using that because that's what Bill Cooper said oh, uh, that they, part, yeah. and so i don't but i mean you know let's just leave it out there if there's yeah. a secret world government that yeah. is not actually our government that alone that could cause some serious serious uh problems besides the fact i also think you know if, if it comes out that they killed jfk and rfk these secret keepers a secret world government i think i mean not to mention that there might be some human trafficking or child i don't know the abduction it, it could cause some people to get really upset, but I mean, I, it seems like this house of cards is going to fall. It's got to fall and humans are going to have to figure out, okay, we need to sort of figure out how do we want to govern ourselves? And if right. we can't trust our current structures and current people, we just have to create, we're going to have to create new ones. And hopefully we can do that without, um, without, you know, mass rioting and, breakdown of law and people right I don't know losing everything if i mean like the banking system collapse the us dollar collapses i mean maybe it's a just another good reason for people to buy a little bitcoin have a little bit of crypto oh yeah it's not yeah. it's starting to go back up thank goodness gee whiz yeah it, yeah interesting stuff happened with the <laughs> happening in the cryptocurrency world definitely <laughs> oh boy, I'll tell you. I you know, I just keep my eyes on it cuz it looks like it was just going to keep stepping down, step step step. And well, now it just went up, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, with the launch of the Bitcoin ETF, um which I am like I'm one of the Bitcoiners who's just like super watching the details of what's going on with these uh ETFs. It's fl money's been flowing out of the big grayscale ETF and seems part of that is just because it was locked up in there. You know, there's $28 billion of Bitcoin in there and FTX had to dump like a billion of it from that. And um, anyway, some money, money is shifting around, but it just seems to be getting into an equilibrium. And it's soon, it just seems it's just a, it's a matter of, I think it's a matter of weeks before pretty much every sensible investor on earth is going to be like, I have to have 1% of my money in Bitcoin at the minimum. It's just, yeah. it just does not make sense for the future to not have, to not cover my bets and put 1% to 3%. And then, and once Bitcoin like does its next pop to a hundred thousand, that then those people are going to have five to 10% of their money in Bitcoin. And, you know, then it shifts their whole mindset. Once you are that deeply invested it's, it's, it's going to be a chain reaction. We're entering the S curve, I think, for Bitcoin adoption. And we're at like 20% of people have a little Bitcoin. I think within a year, it's going to pop up to 60, 70% of people, you know, even if it's just a little bit in their retirement. It's uh, Well, if it's, if it's going to be the currency exchange medium for the metaverse, which some people are, are saying that could, you know, that might be Bitcoin could be the main currency that's going to be used for, you know, all the transactions in the metaverse. Have you heard anything about that? Oh, I just think, you know, Bitcoin, it doesn't even need to do that to go berserk. It's going to be, I think it's gold. It's it's going to be where you store your wealth for the, for the long term and for generational wealth. And, you know, you can always, you might be able to use Bitcoin for transactions, but, you know, all the other cryptocurrencies are trying to, they sort of can build off of, the Bitcoin base and serve as sort of like the super fast, high frequency transactional. And you don't know which one of those will work for that, whether it's something on Ethereum or something on Solana. Um, there is some stuff, there's like the lightning network on the Bitcoin network that might work, but but Bitcoin is going just as a store of value. It's, it's going to be, it's going to match the market cap of gold in no time. And it's right now it's at a $800 billion market cap and it'll go to 10 trillion, which is the market cap of gold. And then I think it's going to pass gold. I think before we know it, 
and it's going to be like at a hundred trillion dollars. It's going to be Ooh. where you store <laughs> your wealth and countries are going to start. I mean, that's the chain reaction that I think we're about to see. We're about to see every retirement account have 1% in it. And that's just retail. Then you're going to see every country starting to put part of their treasury into it. And then you're going to see every major corporation put some of their treasury. In. And then it's, it's just going to be this chain reaction and uh, it's going to be going to be crazy. So what do you what do you think about the uh, kind of the the dream goal for a lot of people would be to see um, Bitcoin and and Ethereum just kind of set the standard for decentralized, you know, social governing systems, decentralized rather than control from the top down? What do you what's your feeling on that? Yeah, I think that's the direction we're going. I yeah, think it uh, the only major piece we're missing be able to use the blockchains and is uh identity you have to have a way to confirm each person only has one identity um so that they only get to vote once right but there's um but there's so much distrust now of the u.s voting system uh mm -hmm. that th there i see people on on news programs mentioning blockchain vo voting they are this is out there they and there's de there are definitely people in the blockchain world trying to figure it out how to use the blockchain for trusted voting and i would trust it more than what what we're doing now because i think what we're doing now is easily manipulated and hackable and yeah yeah i would go yeah, with, I, uh, I would definitely go with blockchain yeah i think it's it, it'll be in, in a way that might be the next revolution you know it's like bitcoin is a way to create perfect transparent currency money and now if we can get to a way for perfect transparent democratic government you know that anyone could use for even for like their own clubs or corporations or churches but also for your towns and cities and state and that would be such a revolution to people be able to trust the voting process and right you now trust the decision making even if you know that could that would really um I mean that's what you need you need trust you need people to be able to trust their money yeah. it's going to save money they need to be able to trust their environment for safety they need to be able to trust that when they give taxes that the department of defense is not going to just like fail audits and use that money for whatever they want building how much how much percentage would you guess uh that our federal taxes go into the the military industrial complex what's the percentage would you guess uh i mean it's i'm, I'm pretty sure it's a, an enormous amount um do you know the actual number or are you just uh no i don't but yeah i would i would guess it's probably up there in the you know 80 percent or something i don't know i have no clue but it's a lot i'm sure well, we could just uh, do a quick ask of chat GPT. Ah. What percent of our taxes go to military? Yeah, federal taxes, right? Yeah. In the United States, the portion of the federal budget allocated defense spending varies each year. For 2021, the defense spending accounted for about 15% of the total federal budget and approximately 50% of discretionary spending. So <laughs> that's what it said. 50% <laughs> of our taxes go to discretionary spending. Is that what it said? It said well, it said 15% of the total budget and 50% of discretionary spending. Um, so I don't I don't know how to yeah, how uh, uh, yeah. but it's but I mean it's I think it's really telling that the Department of Defense fails audits by like trillions of dollars. Every year they're just like, yeah, there's two, three trillion dollars worth of uh money and assets we cannot accurately account for i mean what <laughs> that Oops. is a scam what a scam yeah yeah i mean they're they're wanting to control everybody by every every carbon credit and yet you know look at all this lack of accountability is um sh it's really shocking yeah, yeah. And, and it seems you know and it just seems that the the military conflicts on earth ukraine and now yemen and even israel they seem to just be a way to keep things you know confused because it's so easier in a time of military and violence and fear to to just be able to get whatever money you want to do whatever you want going back to like vietnam korea they just they it seems like 
they wanted to create a war with Cuba. They really tried hard to get JFK to go to war with Cuba. And that's one of the reasons he, he was killed. He, he did not want to feed the war machine. Yeah, I mean, it just goes down so many dark holes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it, it does cause a lot of anxiety. I think a lot of people following this whole issue is just kind of having a, this kind of floating anxieties like what what next? What's going to happen? Who, you know, are we a, are we just an experiment or, you know, is this just opening up a whole new, you know, Shangri-La? I mean, what's going on? We just don't know. Yeah. So that's where meditation comes in. Yeah. Well, with that in mind, are we ready to do a closing meditation? I'm ready for that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. With all this uncertainty, so many questions, um, never really quite knowing what to believe does cause a slight subtle anxiety. And some people it's more than subtle. So the way to manage that by my experience is definitely meditation. And so for the next few minutes, let's just begin to quiet our mind. So as we come into this moment, we're just going to scan our body just to get a sense of where we are in this space at this time. Feeling our feet on the floor. Feeling our butt on the cushion or in the chair. This is right here, right now, this moment right here is the only thing that's really happening. Right now, without spreading our imagination out across the universe, just this moment, our reality right here with our feet on the floor. We'll come to a place in our body where we can relate easily to our breath. It might be the tip of the nose or the abdomen expanding and contracting. So we'll just find that comfortable place and begin to settle in. Breathing in and breathing out. If your mind is extremely active, you can have this internal mantra, just breathing in, breathing out, repeating that over and over, just to help calm the mind. What we're experiencing in our daily life is a lot of unknowns, kind of living in the don't know, as Stephen Levine used to say. How do we get comfortable living in this place of not knowing? Stay present. Relaxed. And some meditation teachers would say it's like keeping your weight balanced right over your feet. You just keep yourself right over your feet. Right here in the moment. When you hear sounds, try to just feel the vibration on your eardrum rather than interpreting the sound.
one of the main points of meditation is to recognize when our thoughts have carried us away. Just to notice it, and that gives us the choice to either continue or to come back to the moment, to the breath. Exercising that skill of noticing that your mind has wandered is like doing a curl at the gym. It really strengthens the ability of the mind to be more under our control rather than under its own volition. The mind is like a monkey jumping from tree to tree and meditation is a way of calming that down. Breathing in, and breathing out. And before we end this brief practice, let's do a little bit of metta, which in Buddhism means loving-kindness practice. So let's imagine we're way out in space looking down on the earth. Beautiful blue earth, clouds and mountains. And we just bring this beautiful planet into our heart and say, may you be well. May you be healthy. All the stories, all the history, the drama, the worries, all taking place on this beautiful blue planet. We'll say to her, May you be happy. May you be uplifted to higher consciousness, greater understanding and wisdom. May all the beautiful life that you hold be well, be happy, and be free. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Dora. Have a great week. You too. Until next time. Yep.